Welcome to Saturday Morning Meeting for Suppliers presented by 8th and Walton, the premier destination for supplier development and sponsored in part by Dun & Bradstreet, the leading provider of credit and credibility solutions for businesses. I'm Andy Shook and thank you for joining us. Today, we're going back and forth in history. First, back to the beginning of retail clubs and then forward to Sam's Clubs. Brad Fagans will be our guide, telling us how it all began as well as the difference between a category-driven retailer like Walmart and an item-driven retailer like Sam's Club. Sounds like fun, right? Then we go back in history to the story of the Good Samaritan and forward to Samaritan Shoes, a charity that ties in well with back to school and one that area suppliers can be a part of. Kyle Alexander of Mach 1 and Graham Gibbs will give us the full story. So, ready for a little history lesson? Today we're here to learn about the history of club stores like Sam's Club and Costco from former VP of Sam's, Brad Fagans. Brad, welcome. Welcome. Yeah, so glad you could make it here today. So it seems like Sam's Club has been around a while, but it's relatively young. How did it get started? Well, it started in Midwest City, Oklahoma, right? With the first Sam's Club that uh, Mr. Sam found the best spot he could find at less than a dollar a square foot, and there was stuff coming a out. A dollar of the a square foot? And there's stuff coming out of the ceiling and all that, but really where he learned the business was from Saul Price out in San Diego. Saul was, uh, had a club business out there called Price Club, and Sam was looking for alternative channels to grow his Walmart Inc. business, and that's where him and Don Soderquist and David Glass went out and did a little homework to see what uh, the club business was all about. Now, the club business, when it first started, was a lot different than it is now. I mean, if I remember correctly, the stories that I heard, I mean, these guys dressed in jeans and they had big case pallet stuff and different things like that. What was it like back then? Well, it was really concrete floors and warehouses. I mean, they did not, uh, their real estate strategy was not to go into malls or any of that kind of thing. It was truly a warehouse yeah. and it was for small business. And that's where it grew. It didn't have any uh, refrigeration. You didn't have fresh foods. You didn't have frozen food. Uh, it was just uh, the bare bones of what a you know a conventional uh, grocer uh, wholesaler was, and and trying to help those small businesses with their bodegas or uh, small sure. small businesses that were out there fundraising, uh, all, all those kind of different things. So, from my understanding, competitors started popping up shortly after after Sam kind of started his club business as well. Who were some of the competitors? Well, they were all they it dwarfed into a, several. You know, there was. Uh, Price Savers out of Utah, you had Wholesale Club out of Chicago, uh, two that I'm very familiar with in uh, Denver was Pace and Buyers Club. Buyers Club. Um, Pace, okay. we started there uh, and, and grew the business. We were for, uh, uh, acquired by Kmart at, at one point, and then eventually uh, uh, Walmart Inc. purchased us from Kmart, and uh, that's what... Uh, kind of almost doubled the business for Sam's Club. And that was one of the first acquisitions, I think, that, that, that Walmart Inc. had really made like that, where they actually went in and bought a, a company like that? No, they had made others. I mean, you can go back to the history of Walmart. They made some acquisitions of uh, small retailers as well. But Sam's Club had also made some other purchases. They bought a company out of uh, Louisiana that was a wholesale-type format and those kind of things. So, uh, no, they, they were in the acquisition mode. So Sam's Club over the years has gone through quite a few different changes. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, uh, you know, it really starts at the top. And, uh, you know, Mr. Sam started this business and wanted to continue to, to grow it. Uh, a lot of expectations. And, and uh, uh, Mr. Loveless was the first president and uh, grew the business. Al Johnson took it to another level. Uh, and then it just kind of went into turmoil and a lot of changeover going back and forth. And, and eventually they've been you know, 30 years, approximately 14 plus presidents. So uh, you look at that versus their competition, uh, Price Club and Costco mm -hmm. basically working on their third president over that same time frame, or a little even a little bit more. So, so why so many presidents? Why so much well, change during that time? Well, again, I think it was just the competition, the expectations, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, trying to grow the business the way that, uh, in the Walmart way, that uh, uh, continued to flip uh, flip the leadership. So you can find a Sam's Club in the U.S. just about everywhere? Yeah, really. Uh, 48 out of 50 states in the continental United States are in Puerto Rico, uh, China, the, all those different areas. But, you know, their core business is here in the 48 yeah. states. And, and tell me about the Sam's Club business now the, in the U.S. What is it? 
Oh, you're you're looking at about sixty billion, which put it, puts them in the top ten, uh, which is it was is awesome. Uh, you know, the standalone company, top ten. That's that's something that uh, you can be very proud of. Uh, about like I said, sixty million, about one hundred and twenty thousand associates. You've got uh, six hundred and forty plus clubs. Uh, so there's a lot from a, from a supplier standpoint and a manufacturer standpoint to look at where that distribution can help them. So Sam's Club, and I, I would say the Sam's Club biggest competition is Costco? Oh, absolutely. Okay, let's talk a little bit about Costco. What, what, what makes them different? What's the history there? Well, Costco uh, is the leader, and that's an unfortunate situation. It's an uncomfortable situation for, for us. Uh, I say us, but Walmart Inc. Well, you haven't been number that two. long, yeah. <laughs> but they're number <laughs> two, right? Like, yeah. They're number two, and they like being number one. But Costco... They've really uh, stayed with a true strategy. They haven't changed it, and they're just very, very consistent. And uh, what kind of business do they do in comparison to kind of where Sam's Club is at? Well, uh, they started. They merged with Price Club. Uh, oh, in the in the eighties, early nineties, uh, and they started with when they merged those two companies together. About sixteen billion. Uh, they just reported sales of over one hundred and ten billion. One hundred and ten uh, billion. And about four hundred and seventy clubs with here within the United States. So you look at Sam, 640, 60 billion. They have 474 plus 100, bi- uh, 100 wow. billion. That's so they, they, they are a formidable appoint, uh, opponent, and they stay to, uh, true to what they uh, uh, have stand, stood for since Saul Price started the company. And what, where do you see the biggest difference between the two? Well, uh, obviously the first place you start is what I call the islands, right? Because they're on the beaches on the East Coast and the West Coast where the majority of the people are. Mm, And so that's helped them tremendously. They were first to market in a lot of those big markets, concentrated of people. Uh, They've they've gained their members' trust as the buying agent. Uh, Their members trust their private brand, and they trust the items that they're going to bring to them at a value and the brands they're looking for, and, and they have a very... Uh, high-end consumer that has a lot of expendable income. Yeah, and Brett, now you were VP at Sam's Club, and yes, VP sir. of what? What area were you in? Uh, had numerous uh, titles. I was vice president and uh, divisional merchandise manager for 15 years. Uh, held a, a majority of different roles in, in food and consumables. Um, my last four or five years was uh, in merchandise solutions, which was really helping the merchants and also. Uh, understanding what was going on with uh, feature planning and demos and, and uh, road shows. And so were you the one that brought variety. in that, uh, that little uh, um, kiosk that does the... Uh, uh, one the, of my folks did do, did do that. Did, did yes. that, okay. The sample, the free house sample. Yeah, the yes. free house, yeah. The yes. free house, yeah. That yep. was a, that's yep. a great thing. Great, great story yeah. there. Oh, no doubt. Well, I know you're coming back on the show again, so maybe we'll get a chance to share that story a little bit as well. But what are you going to be talking about next time? Well, really, uh, I mean, when you're sitting here in Bentonville, Arkansas, you've got really two bookends. You've got Walmart, Inc., and you've got Sam's Club, and and they are distinctly different when you look at that. Uh, Sam's Club is an item business. It's one item. Uh, Walmart's more of a category business. So I'd like to visit with you on that if we could. So, Brad, why are warehouse clubs so popular? Well, they really gained speed over the last five to eight years. Downturn of the economy. Customers across the United States were looking for value, right? And we sell in bulk. And we have a high-quality product at a very uh, instrumental value that the, mm. the, the members are looking for. You get the high-quality strawberries, which, which are phenomenal, um, detergent, you know, your consumer goods, and then you can get apparel at phenomenal prices. Yeah. And then, you know, patio furniture is just unbelievable <laughs> when you start looking at the values out there. So, again, I think a lot of it, uh, it's been around for a long time, but it really gained traction in the last five to eight years when the economy started going south and everybody was starting mm-hmm. to look for, okay, how am I going to feed this family and how am I going to do it at a, at a value? And I think that's really where it gained traction. Brad, you mentioned Costco and how special they were in different, in different ways. What makes Sam's Club special? Well, Sam's Club really has got a, a root, right? I mean, being a namesake of Mr. Sam himself, that's special in itself mm. within the Walmart family. So it really starts there. And they really grew. I mean, they started in Midwest City. I mean, that's not San Diego by any stretch of the imagination. So it really was Mr. Sam's uh, look to really start in the inner, the, those cities that could really help people and, uh, you know, live, live better. And that's really what the story was. And Sam, Sam's Club has continued to nurture that. Is, and, and they have a unique culture 
uh, that uh, really tries to go after that uh, middle America and, and really help them. Bella Vista Village property owners have access to golf, fishing, tennis, nature trails, and more. To become a member or to learn more, go to bvvpoa.com. meeting tomorrow 9 a.m. time for a miracle time for rapid prototypes emergency packaging services means shelf ready packaging and displays printing to almost any material beyond photo quality short run production for sales samples or store tests need it all customize your look with our structural graphic and 3d design need a miracle rapid prototypes rapid-prototypes.com or 479-273-FAST My colleagues and I were lucky enough to have a custom course put together for us by Ethan Waldman, IRS, our instructor. It focused on all the different aspects of what an analyst might need from retailing to work with Walmart. I think what surprised me most is that there were so many things that I had not been using in Retail Link that would be valuable for me and that I hadn't attempted to use yet. Um, and also just some tips and shortcuts. IRS had a lot, has a lot of experience and she knows how to help you find things that are going to help you do your work. With us today is Brad Fagan, former VP of Sam's Club. So tell us a little bit about items versus categories. Why is that different in the club business versus what we do at, let's say, Walmart and, and other retailers like well, that? Well, first, it's just number, right? So you walk into Walmart, and I couldn't imagine how many SKUs they have in there. Probably <laughs> hundreds to, of thousands, uh, exactly, right? Exactly, really. So there's that. And a club business is somewhere between 4,500 and 6,500 items, right? So you're trying to capture all those sales in 45 to 6,500 items within there. And so an item becomes very important. When you look at a category, uh, would be a good example? Let's think about cereal, right? Sure. Cereal may have 150, 200 SKUs in a Walmart, where in the Sam's Club, it's probably somewhere between 15 and 25. And, you know, that's one of the, with that and breakfast bars are probably the largest categories in dry grocery. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to capitalize on all that sales with just, with a, just limited, a very limited, limited number of SKUs. SKUs. So it becomes so an item, so an item it, merchant. And sometimes it's done in rotations, right? So you might have something in for 13 weeks, might come in, and then another item comes in right. during that time. Uh, but typically they're the largest selling SKUs. Right. So you really want to make sure that you, you hook that member on the core SKUs that you want, right? So that if, if we go back and we talk about laundry detergent, you know, uh, Procter & Gamble's got the number one SKU out there and that being tied. So you want to make sure your members can always get tied at a value. But there may be some other things, flavors or s different scents of, of uh, laundry detergent that you bring in in an in mm -hmm. out uh, time frame. But at the end of the day, it's all about an item. And you want to make sure that that item shows value. You want to make sure it has differentiation in the marketplace to help with that value. And you want to make sure it has the attributes that your members are looking for. So those are the kind of things you want to look at in, in an item merchant. And being an item merchant is, is a whole different ball game than being a category merchant, right? So I'm a supplier out there, and I'm looking at bringing my item to Sam's Club. What, what are some things that I should be looking at? Well, first of all, where else is the item sold? Okay. Uh, you, you know, if it's, uh, you know, we, we talked about it uh, offset here is, you know, biggie size and something. 
uh, just club, make it. Yeah, yeah. Club, well, like I remember club. the days when we used to just take two items and we'd stick them together. Yep. Matter of fact, I remember the old days with pizza where we'd actually take a pizza's wrap them <laughs> in tape yes. and then put an item number on it and call that a, a value pack or a pack for right. Sam's Club. Right, because the manufacturer wasn't ready to make that commitment for that extra packaging right. or that, that item. So you had to do that to test it. And and really, that, that helps sales as well because you as a mom would go in and buy those two pizzas so you'd take one home for you right. and I'd take it home for my neighbor and therefore there was value in that. So when we went to bulk sizes, we kind of got away from that and that hurt sales a little bit. So packaging is key to to making sure that that value is there and also maintaining freshness as well. You don't want to mm. you don't want to have a big pallet, uh, pillow pack of potato chips because by the time you get down to the end of them, they're all crumbles and they're all stale, right? right. There's no value in that. So packaging is key, value is key and the and the quality uh, especially in the club business, is uh, second to none. You want to make sure that you got the cream of the cream, whether in that quality. Is it the right meat? Is it the right uh, detergent? Paper towel? You don't want low end. You don't want middle. Of, you know, you don't want a good, better, best. Right. You just want the best. Well, and you know, I know Sam's has also made some changes as well. That they're doing testing kitchens. They're actually getting people tasting products, especially on the food side. Yes. To see whether or not you know is the quality there, is the taste there, where does it rank, and you know, you have you have these testing kitchens that we go into. Mm -hmm. um, how has that changed things? Well, that's helped things, right? Because you want to make sure that uh, with a limited amount of SKUs. Your productivity of that SKU has got to come out of the box quick. Right. So any homework you can do on the front side, whether it's a test kitchen, those kind of things. Consumer studies. Con consumer studies. What does the member want? Because you really, you know, we've said it before, but you want to be the buying agent for that member. So how how else is there a better way to do that than a test kitchen where you can really get their feedback and it, build the item to them? Explain that because that's really a... a, a the, the way that, that Sam's Club buyers look at things is they want to be the buyer's agent. What does that mean? Well, it's really, you know, we don't want to buy good, better, best. We want to be the buying agent for the member. So if they're buying it, that item for Brad Fagan's, they want to make sure that that meets every one of Brad Fagan's needs and, and there's a value in it. So they're a buying agent for it. You will also see from a Costco perspective that if they can't get the right value for that item, they won't carry it. You'll see them put signs mm. up in, uh, in uh, one example I saw recently was with Coke products. Okay. Where they put a sign up in, the, in, in, their, in their clubs that said, we're not going to have Coke products for the next X amount of weeks because we can't buy it at a value to support the cost of your membership. So those are wow. the kind of things that wow. are buying agent for the member. So Brad, who are the members at Sam's Club and Costco? Well, you really got it really defined by two, really, because this business started with business members. And business members trying to take care of the small restaurants, the booster clubs, the concession stands, the, uh, I call it the roach coats where you've, you're trying to make that sandwich for the construction people right. and all those kind of things. So you've, uh, or the office, you know, the small office, how do I build that out with the office supplies, all those kind of different things. So there's the business aspect. And so you want to have a, cur a certain amount of those SKUs in an item business that can service those business members. On the flip side of that, you want to blend a, both a business member and a, an advantage, uh, a savings member or a plus member. Right. There's, there's a number of ways the industry calls those, but they're basically mom, right, that, that are buying those things for her family and making sure that they can have the value that they want to put the right meal on the table or get those items that are special, whether it's a, you know, a special bottle of wine at an extraordinary price or the patio furniture or the pool mm. uh, toys or whatever it is, those are the kind of things they're looking for or if they can get that special shirt for you on Easter. So Again, it goes back to the supplier knowing and understanding who their customer is. Right. Is it that business member and how they package it and how they put it together yep. and, and present it as well? Well, and the best items really fit both needs, right? So right. If, I could, right. if I could create a T-shirt, if I have a great T-shirt that I may be able to buy and I have a print shop, maybe I can buy all my T-shirts from Sam's Club and then use my printing business to print on those and I've created uh, I've created a different... There uh, you go. Uh, ...a different business. So those are all the kind of things that you try to think about. Brad, thank you so much for coming in today. We really appreciate it. Um, you're going to be back on the show again, from what I understand, and you're going to be talking to us about the food drug mass shopper versus the club shopper and giving Absolutely. us some insight on that. Great. Yeah. I can't wait. All right. Well, Saturday morning meeting for suppliers. We'll be right back. Introducing MB Retail. 
the smart device-driven team management software. Using your existing staff and smart devices, every retail changes the game by leveraging the full power of mobile team management, all while consolidating multiple management systems into a comprehensive software solution for your business. Whether you are a selling, merchandising, training or service organization, MV Retail has you covered, so don't delay. Contact MV Retail today to set up a free trial. Mach 1 Financial Group has moved to Bentonville. Now we're easier to find and even better equipped to assist you with your financial needs. Visit us at our new location, 408 North Walton Boulevard, and check out our state-of-the-art Lunch and Learn conference room. Bentonville Commerce, less than one mile from the Walmart home office. You'll love the convenience, amenities, and customized options Bentonville Commerce offers. For more information or a tour, call 479-200-1112 today. GigWalk is transforming how work gets done. As the leading mobile workforce management platform, GigWalk provides companies with mobile tools and a data-driven approach to improving business efficiency. Leading brands and retailers use GigWalk to manage their field teams and to mobilize 750,000 GigWalkers to collect data intelligence about their business and brands. Are the shelves stocked? Are my products priced competitively? Are the correct promotions in place? Visit us at GigWalk.com to learn more. GigWalk. Make work better. We're here today with Graham Gibbs from Samaritan's Feet and Kyle Alexander from Mach 1 Financial. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Graham, can you give us a little background on Samaritan's Feet? What's it all about? Sure. Well, uh, we're a faith-based humanitarian relief organization that uses shoes as a vehicle to show love and compassion to other human beings. So uh, we, uh, about 60% of our distributions are done internationally, 40% of them are done here in the States. A unique aspect of what we do is we just don't give shoes away. It's, uh, we have an intimate process of giving those shoes away and that's uh, including washing feet. So actually every volunteer will get down on their knees, in some cases in chairs and others, and look a child or another individual into the, in, in their eyes and have a real intimate interaction with them as we give them a gift and hopefully inspire them. Now how long has Samaritan's Feet been around? 11 years. 11 years? And, and, and how have you gotten involved with it, Kyle? Yeah, this is a good story. I mean, uh, Graham and I actually worked together uh, for a supply chain management organization a few years ago. And uh, I knew he had gone into charitable organizational service. And uh, we had a conversation one day, and I had joined uh, with a financial services company, Mach 1 Financial. We were looking for a charity that, that meshed, meshed really well with our culture. Sure. Right. So, uh, one, it was Christian based. Two, it was service oriented. And three, it made a difference in local communities as well as the world. And so that's really how we chose. Uh, Samaritan's feet. And, and how's that experience been? What Have you actually gone out on some of these feet washings and, and done some of this with the kids and been oh, able to yeah. see? What, oh, what's that absolutely. like? Oh, it's incredible. I mean, the first time, I, I'll be honest with you, I was really dubious about doing it. I mean, you know, being a friend of Graham, I was like, well, I'll, I'll try this. <laughs> sure, right? sure. I'll give it a shot. So, but, Friends get us to do all kinds oh, of things, do. don't they? The leverage of friendship. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so so I, I joined him in one of these events, and uh, I saw the amazing impact that it had on a child. One, to receive that kind of love from another human being, and maybe they haven't ever received that kind of love from, mm. from another person. And it really wasn't about the shoes. It was about the love and the joy and, the, um, and really the, the positive message that, uh, that we, could, we could show that child. Sure. And it was really an incredible experience. And, and two, the, uh, the, the amount of poverty that's in Benton County, really all of Northwest Arkansas, is much greater than you see on the surface. And that's the thing that really uh, uh, startled me. Uh, and really changed my attitude about the whole thing. And it really isn't about giving shoes, it's about giving hope. Yeah, and just some statistics so that uh, everybody knows. Um, the estimates are statewide uh, children K through 12, 70% are either on or eligible for free and reduced lunches. Mm. That's a statistic that we use to gauge need. And Northwest Arkansas is not immune from that. I mean, we're in the 60s to 70% up here. A lot of well, people- Well, we're kind of in this supplier bubble, Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. That we kind of think, but when you actually kind of start digging down into the layers, yes. there is a lot of poverty in this Absolutely. area. Absolutely, and you know, it's not, I mean, a lot of work we do internationally, the, the people don't have shoes, right? right. So we, we, don't, we don't have that here, but what people don't see is what's happening within the shoe, right? We see kids that are wearing two to three sizes too small. We see boys mm -hmm. wearing girls' shoes. We see shoes that are falling apart. So all of that's, that's where the need for shoes comes into play in Arkansas, Northwest Arkansas. 
Um, but just like Kyle said, um, it's really our, our, our events and our outreach is more than just the shoe. The shoe is the vehicle we use to have that one-on-one -on -one interaction and with the hopes of inspiring that child or that adult. And shoes every year. Right? Or every six months. Right. Actually, that's for some right. kids, it's almost every six yeah. months, isn't right. it? Absolutely. So it's consumable. It's something that's going to be happening. Now, as far as Northwest Arkansas goes, suppliers and, and other um, businesses around the community, how do they get involved in this? Sure. Well, um, you know, we're always in need of financial support. So okay. that's this, that's in one way. But, you know, for us, more important than the, some, the financial support is just what Kyle talked about is the service aspect of it. Um, there's really something special about serving another human being in the way that our process allows. Mm -hmm. um, it's as impactful for the, uh, the servant as it is for the recipient. Absolutely. And so we encourage uh, organizations to get involved uh, from that aspect, to come serve. I mean, there's a lot of different things that we've seen businesses use this process to help within their own organization, um, having you know the vice president of an organization serving right next to a frontline person, right. breaking down hierarchy, breaking down you know uh, pods of workers and stuff like that. So there's a lot of different things that, and, that and can it really be used. goes beyond team building. Absolutely, doesn't it? And yes. Have you witnessed that? Have you seen that? Yeah, with I've, teams? I've actually experienced it myself. I mean, my background is not nonprofit. It's uh, it's business. It's logistics. Um, and I was part of a company that was partnered with Samaritan's Feet. That's how I got introduced to the organization. And uh, we, they actually sponsored an event. And so I got to see my CMO, my CFO, the president of my company, humbling themselves and washing the feet of children. And what that did for me as an employee was it drew me closer to my leadership team, but it also wow. just drew me closer to the organization. So there's a lot of power in it, and that's, that's what we would encourage businesses to maybe look at partner with us, suppliers partnering with us, to try to, to try to find a way that maybe they can not only impact the community, but maybe you know, impact their corporate culture as well. Yeah. Well, Graham, Kyle, thank you both so much for coming in today and sharing this wonderful story. And hopefully other companies will be able to get involved in this in the future. Awesome. Absolutely. Thank you. And Appreciate I challenge it. folks, you don't have to be a large organization to do it either. I mean, we have eight people in our organization. Yeah. And um, there's a lot of vendor community people in, in this very area that have 50 or plus more employees, but a lot of them are small. And you don't have to be a large organization to mm -hmm. give back to your community. Find something you're passionate about, get excited about it, get behind it, yeah. and go make a difference in yeah. your community. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for coming in today. We really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Saturday morning meeting for suppliers. We'll be right back. K-Stack, the leader in collaborative retail consolidation programs. We offer the supply chain expertise needed to navigate the challenges of selling products with the world's largest retailers. And we provide customers with a customizable, scalable, environmentally sustainable supply chain with the same advanced technology typically used by larger rivals. By leveling the playing field, K-Stack lowers distribution costs and increases overall margins. K-Stack, retail logistics is what we do. Bentonville Plaza, across the street from the Walmart home office. The best office location offers proximity and services like no other business complex in the area. Call 479-200-1112 today. Retail Solutions is the market leader helping advance reporting and analytics with Walmart suppliers around the globe. We manage the data for you, automate data integration, attribution, and reports, and then help you focus on activities that will drive the most value. To do this, RSI works with you to perform a business value assessment to identify the largest value opportunities in your business. If improving results in sales through better insights and execution and efficiencies are important to you, contact RSI today. Bella Vista Village property owners have access to golf, fishing, tennis, nature trails, and more. To become a member or to learn more, go to bvvpoa.com. Thank you for watching Saturday Morning Meeting for Suppliers. Everything we do at 8th and Walton is to help suppliers become better partners with Walmart, and we hope today's show has done that for you. Don't forget to check out the 8th and Walton site, 8thandwalton.com, for more information about becoming a smarter supplier. From all of us at Saturday Morning Meeting for Suppliers, thanks for watching. Our guests enjoy staying at the 21C Museum Hotel and hosting dinner, meetings, and product launches there.